All right, so thank you all for coming. I'm excited to have a group here to talk about eco roots. I know a lot of people always ask me about it. And a lot of people are always really excited to hear about it. Um, so I decided to put a little presentation together and just share my knowledge. So I'm Gil Lopez. I work for a company called Future Green Studio in Brooklyn. It's a design build company. Um, I'm primarily a construction manager and we primarily do green roofs. We also do all sorts of other landscaping stuff. Today I have the glorious job of pulling weeds out of tree pits. Um, so it's not always, you know, basking in the sun-drenched rooftops of New York City. Sometimes it's pulling weeds out of the doggy poo. <laughs> so um, I also am starting a local cooperative based in Queens. It's a landscape company. It's called Nourishing Cities. And it's going to focus on edible landscapes, green infrastructure, and bioremediation. Um, I also have a gorilla garden in Long Island City. Um, if anyone's unfamiliar with that term, it simply means that me and some friends are using land without the permission of the landowner to grow food and beautify the street. So this is what's happening. That's my Twitter handle. That's Trade School's Twitter handle. That's the date. That's where we are. Not in that order. Um, so today we're going to talk about an eco-roof. I'm going to tell you what an eco-roof is. We're going to talk about white roofs, blue roofs, green roofs, green cloaking, green roof policy, brown roofs, uh, living walls, and rooftop farming. Not necessarily in that order. Um, but maybe I'll finish up in time to have some question and answer. So what exactly is an eco-roof? The term eco-roof, as you can see here, I'm going to kind of read, read these stuff. I have a bunch of definitions, and I'm going to read them to you. Um, it refers to a treatment on top of a structure that has some ecological benefit. The term is often used synonymously with green roof or cool roof, which indicates roofs that use some form of environmental green technology to create lower temperatures, such as a white or blue roofs, solar, thermal collectors, and photovoltaic panels. Another defi others defined in this presentation. So I'm not going to talk about um, wind turbines and solar panels, but technically if they're on top of a roof, that's a green technology that could be referred to as an eco-roof or a green roof. Um, it's all kind of askew, like, um, we'll get into it, but some people, when you refer to a cool roof, they think you're referring to a white roof, which might be true, that the white roof people have kind of grabbed the term cool roof, and now, like, even though blue roof or a green roof or some, any, a bunch of other eco roofs could be cool by the definition of, like, lowering temperatures, um, it generally refers to a white roof. And green roof, which is my favorite type of roof, um, has been co-opted by like all of it. So if you say green roof, it's an ambiguous statement. You could be talking about a white <coughs> roof, a blue roof, a green roof, or anything that is either or, or something with thermal panels on it. So when you say green roof, nobody knows what you're talking about anymore because it's kind of all over the place. Um, so, just a little bit of background, the design trust <coughs> for public land um, estimates that there's more than 13 central parks worth of open space, under, underused open space in the form of vacant lots and rooftops in the city. So that stat came out like a couple of years ago, and then last year, um, the Earth Institute at Columbia came out with a report. A guy named Kubi Ackerman <coughs> led the research. Um, and this is, it was called The Potential for Urban Agriculture in New York City. It was looking very specifically at where we could grow food. And he, this is a map. All the blue represent different types of rooftop areas, um, primarily ones that are big enough to feasibly do green, uh, agriculture on top of roofs. Which, do we need more chairs? I can, I can grab more chairs. 
Alright. Okay. We'll probably have to grab a gun for anyway. But, um... So, he calculated it all up, and he separated out the, the roofs that are on top of buildings that have the floor to area ratio already maxed out. Because in New York City, you cannot build on top of a building that already has a max floor to area ratio. It's a building code. I'm not going to go too deep into that, but you just can't do it. So, he separated them out. Um, but now there's legislation, or there's talk of creating a retrofitting the code so that you can put green roofs and um, green houses on top of buildings that are already at the max far. So I just took all the numbers that he had there up and totaled them and it equals 3,080 acres of rooftop space that can be used in the city for eco roofs. Uh, not just urban agriculture but eco roofs in general. So cool roofs lower the temperature, right? of the surrounding areas. And they also have other benefits that we're going to go into. But I wanted to talk about some ways that cooling happens. And we're going to go a little bit deeper into some of these terms because some, some of them are actually incorporated in the specific different types of roofs. But there's solar reflectance, which is just the ability of a material to reflect light and heat, UV radiation, back into the atmosphere. Um, and then there's thermal resistance, which is insulation. So anything that blocks heat from going down into the building. Um, thermal emittance is a relatively complicated term. All it really means is that something can absorb the heat, but it quickly releases it back into the atmosphere. Um, to give an example, a tin roof does not have good thermal emittance. Anything that is highly conductive does not have good thermal emittance. Um, wood and clay have very good thermal emittance because they can absorb heat but they also release it very fairly quickly. Um, so thermal mast, any ballasting, the, the, it shows gravel there, anything with mass that can absorb heat and um, release it at, in, during a longer period of time, it, it slows down the fluctuation of heat. Uh, the heat exchange. And there's transpiration, which plants do. Um, we're going to go into that a little bit later, but it basically is just releasing water into the atmosphere through the soma. Um, and then there's convection, which is the general principle that heat rises and it's replaced by cooler uh, air or liquid, any kind of liquid, water or air. Um, so those are some general principles. We're going to talk about white roofs first. Um, we're going to define it, we're going to talk about some key terms. Uh, talk a little bit about installation, New York City Green Code, um, and some of the benefits. I'm going to grab some more chairs real quick. Okay, pass and if that you have stuff. space next to you, if you could move up there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Oh yeah, packed tops. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, we're gonna talk about white roofs. So this is a picture that I stole from somebody that's involved with the white roof project here in New York. That they posted this on Facebook and they took a trip to Italy and they were like, you know, this is like a really old village. And what do you notice? about these buildings. White. They, they're white, that's right, and the roofs are white. This isn't like some new thing that we're like all of a sudden discovering, although we kind of are. We're, we're in a phase right now where we're kind of rediscovering our indigenous knowledge. So, and then we're having to create codes that say that we're supposed to do it. It's kind of crazy, but it's the truth. So, white roofs, there's a definition. The White Roof Project, which I just talked about, um, defines a white roof as one that's painted with solar reflectance, white coating, and reflects up to 90% of sunlight, as opposed to a traditional black roof, which reflect only 20%. Um, the Cool Roof Rating Council, which is a nationwide type of thing, defines a cool roof 
aka a white roof. They call them cool roofs. They don't refer to them as white roofs. So they're totally taking cool roof and saying that's a white roof. Um, they define it as a roof that reflects and emits the sun's heat back into the sky instead of transferring it to the building below. Coolness is measured by two properties, which is solar reflectance and thermal emittance. Both properties are measured from, one, from zero to one, and the higher the value, the cooler the roof. So zero to one, it's a percentage. Zeros, it doesn't like reflect anything. One, it reflects 100%. Um, so here's, we're going to talk about some key terms that are important uh, in realizing why we want to do these things. So urban heat island. Does anybody before seeing this know what that means? Awesome, I'm teaching a lot of people tonight. So urban heat island is the basic phenomenon of impervious hardscape surfaces in urban areas, built environments, absorbing heat and re releasing it later on. So it absorbs heat in the middle of the day and it releases a little bit then, which increases the amount of heat. So if you have like a 90 degree day and everything around you is absorbing heat, you have you're sitting and standing in the middle of an asphalt street and it's black or an asphalt parking lot and it's all black and it's just, it's oppressively hot. It doesn't feel like 90 degrees, right? It feels like 100 and 110. That's because everything around you is absorbing heat, and it's just holding it right there. And when you have a whole city that does that, then the temperatures in the, in the city, the whole area, just go up. Um, whereas in areas where there's more green spaces or more reflective spaces, um, the temperatures tend to be not as high. Um, so... It increases the need for AC, which compounds the pro AC is air conditioning, um, which compounds the problem because then you're re 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 emitting CO2, which is a greenhouse gas, uh, which warms the area, which makes more need for AC. Uh, so it's a vicious cycle, really. So solar reflectance. This is a nice little diagram that really shows um, how it works. It's really simple. The sun's heat is reflected. Um, there's a term called albedo, which I prefer. Um, it means the same thing as solar reflectance. Um, and basically, it reflects the solar energy back into the atmosphere, away from the building's interiors. Um, and it's measured as the proportion of solar energy reflected from zero to one. One, like I said, was 100%. So, the white reflective elastomeric roof coating, generally it's, it's defined by ASTM, ASTM code. ASTM is a standard testing materials, American standard testing material uh, code. Um, and things, every building material has a certain spec that it has to meet. And white roof reflective elastomeric material um, is defined by different ASTM. The, the better ones are 0.7 and above. So that means that they reflect 70% of the heat and radiation from the sun or more. And, it's, and you're told what it is. Whenever you go buy a, a, a gallon or a roll of this stuff, it'll tell you what the, what the reflectance or the albedo of it is. So generally <coughs> it is uh, bought in like a a paint, like a, a five-gallon bucket. And um, some people roll it on. The preferred method is to spray it on. And you can get rolls of it, um, which comes, it's a double-sided, uh, well, it's, a, it's a, got a sticky back, uh, much like uh, bichethane, which is a weatherproofing material that you use on top of rooftops. Um, I've got a little piece of bichethane here, I believe. Yeah, I was... Um, weatherproofing some planter boxes the other day and just held on to a piece. So this is really sticky stuff. Um, this is black, uh, which is generally what you get when, it, when you're not buying the white stuff. The white stuff, of course, is more expensive um, because it's got this as ASTM standards. But you just peel it off and this stuff back here is super sticky and it's used for weatherproofing. So you put this around 
like any penetrations in the roof. Jeez, I don't see any penetrations here. All right, so you see this duct over here, and this, I don't even know if that's part of the roof, but, you, you know, ACs and, you know, the little fans and everything on top of the roof. That penetrates the roof, and it leaves um, a place where there's a high probability of water getting in. So you have to weatherproof that. Um, and it's good to do that with silicone and then some of this stuff, and then if you have it, some tar or spray adhesive. Um, you want to do as good a job weatherproofing as possible. <coughs> so New York City just came up with um, and implemented a local law, Local Law 21, and um, it has to do with um, new construction and retrofitting. Uh, well, not retrofitting, but um, redevelopment. So any building that is being redeveloped, if more than 50% of the rooftop is being replaced, then you're required to make a, um, I'm going to say eco-roof because the terminology is ambiguous, but they're encouraging white roofs, um, and it says, and they have some exemptions, um, and if you see number two, green roofs can be substituted for a white roof. Um, so that's a good thing, in my opinion. And they give like the minimum thermal emittance, 0.75. Um, and they also use a, a solar reflectance in, index, SRI, of 78. I'm not as familiar with those numbers, but uh, you get the general idea. They, they have a pretty stringent standard set for... Um, you want another chair back there? Okay, cool. So this is really encouraging news. Um, this was, I don't remember when this was passed, but it was like this year, I believe, like the beginning of this year, maybe January or February. So really exciting. Um, you know, there are some exemptions, but they all make sense, except for the one that talks about um, this one. I don't understand this one. Any portion of a roof used by a school or daycare as a playground for children. And lots of roofs are used by daycares for, you know, playgrounds. But I don't understand why they would say that it's okay to have those kids play in a roof that is much hotter than it would be if it was a white roof. Because in fact, um, this is more so, more so true with green roofs, but on a, on a hot day, say a 90 degree day, um, a black roof can absorb 80% of that heat, and it can be up to 120, 125 degrees on that roof. Um, with a white roof, it's going to feel more like 90. With a green roof, it's actually going to lower the temperature by 5 or 10 degrees. So it's going to feel more like 85 or 80. So there, is, there could be a difference of almost 40 degrees uh, in temperature. Uh, when you're dealing with a cool roof and a traditional black tar roof. Um, so we have some benefits of the white roofs. The technical benefits are the re reduced air conditioning use resulting in energy savings. Um, the peak energy savings and energy grid stability, lower roof maintenance costs and extended roof light, avoiding re-roofing costs and reducing solid waste, um, and it also complies with building codes. Uh, I forgot to mention this at the beginning, but if anybody has questions, please feel free to ask them. I know I'm going to try and have time at the end for question and answers, but I generally don't like feeling like I'm talking to people, or at people, or down to people. Um, so please speak up uh, if you have any questions. I'd love to try and answer them for you. Um, so everybody understands that, you know, peak energy savings and grid stability. Um, so the human benefits is that it decreases smog and that has a better public health aspect to it. The reason it decreases smog is because it decreases the amount of AC that you're using. Um, and it also, when you decrease the temperature, this is kind of a weird thing to try and, under, uh, try and explain, but the, con the convection of the heat rising actually helps reduce the amount of smog that occurs in the air at ground level. 
Um, so when you cool, when your temperatures are cooler, you're actually reducing the level of smog that can get um, trapped at the small at the lower levels, um, and it increases occupant comfort, especially during hot summer months, especially on the upper floors of a building. Um, so the ecological benefits is a redu reduction in urban heat island effect and smog. Um, energy savings equates to, to global warming mitigation and indirect energy savings to reduce AC use and lower heat island and ambient temperatures. So we're going to talk about blue roofs next. Yes. Before you move on, I have a question on white roofs. Sure. <clears throat> we collect rain in a rain barrel from the gutter that falls off our roof. It's a flat roof. It's black and it's tar. Mm -hmm. I don't use that water on our food plants because I'm thinking there's probably some pretty bad stuff in it, given what's on the roof. So I use it on my uh, decorative plants. I'd right. love to be able to use it on my and feel confident about it. Would putting a white roof on this material help mitigate some of the runoff from whatever is in Not the really. Tar? I mean... There's nothing wrong with the rainwater coming off your roof already. Um, typically, what you want to do is have a first flush, which you want to calculate the the area of your roof and find out how much rain has to fall before it washes the entire roof. And you want to have a, a small cistern that catches that amount of water, and then you want to have an overflow. So anything above that goes into your regular rain, rain catchment cistern and you can use that for gardening, irrigation, whatever it is you want to use. But um, the, there's nothing inherently, you know, biologically wrong with a standard asphalt, shingle, whatever kind of uh, roof it is that you have. Um, but there are, like, toxins in the air that can settle on roofs and after time can, you know, pollute rainwater that comes onto that roof. So that's why you want to get your first flush and store that and get rid of that um, just into the sewer system. And then you can use the rest of your water. So uh, it would similarly be true to a white roof, you'd want to get the first flush as well if you had yeah, a white roof on Yeah, definitely. Okay. Um, for sure. But that's, I mean, I don't know, it's not that big of a deal in that first flush. Unless you're just like underneath a smokestack somewhere. You know? I, I just look at our roof and it just looks so it. Like I wouldn't yeah. want to drink, you know, right. potentially drink water from it. Right. In an indirect can, way through a carrot. Or I, can, I can understand that. But rainwater is much better for your plants than um, the water that comes from your tap or the hose or whatever it may be. Um, anybody, any other questions about white roofs before we move to blue roofs? Yes. Do they degrade very quickly? Or? No. They don't. I didn't talk about this much. I mentioned that it actually increases the life of a roof. It, it actually average, it, it probably doubles the life of your roof. Uh, the reason that is, is because when UV radiation is the biggest degrader of um, building materials outside of salt water. Um, and when you reflect that UV radiation back into the atmosphere, you're not letting it just kill your rooftop. So you have to replace a roof every so often, about 25 to 35 years um, on average. So when you apply a white roof, um, it doubles that. So your roof could last 30 to 70 years now. Um, that said, you need to any any eco roof that you're going to install needs to be installed on top of a fresh roof. I mean, just because you're painting paint something white doesn't mean you have to do everything else. You need to have a roof. You don't you don't just put the elastomeric uh, polymer on top of plywood. You have to have a roof contractor, or if you know what you're doing, you have to install a roof, um, and it has to be watertight and all that good stuff. Uh, but applying the white roof on top of it can double the light because of the UV radiation and because of the um, the temperature fluctuation throughout the day. Uh, typically, uh, I wish I had a chart of this, but typically what happens is it spikes the, the heat uh, from your roof and the temperature of the building materials spikes around 2 or 3 in the afternoon and then it drops drastically. When you have a white roof, it spikes. It still spikes around the same time. The spike is much lower than if it were black. So your 
you're mellowing out that fluctuation of temperature, which also um, increases the life of any materials, because heat is another big degrader of building materials. Anyone else? Cool. So blue roofs, we're going to talk kind of the same format, um, definition and construction, key terms, uh, and then some benefits. So a blue roof is simply catching and storing water on top of a roof during the peak flow of a rain event. Um, they're not vegetated, um, so they don't have plants on top of them necessarily. Uh, they, they just basically capture water. Um, the most typical is to do this type of thing, but there is also not this is kind of a modular system, but there is also just like widespread gravel all over a roof. Um, and then you build what's called a weir around your drain. So flat roofs are actually pitched, generally about 2% in some direction, usually towards the middle, to a roof drain. Um, and the roof drain just catches all that water and sends it to the, to the sewer system. Now, if you build a weir around your roof drain, then you're making um, a little wall around your roof drain. And you can do that, um, you know, an inch and a half, two inches, whatever it is. But that's going to create ponding everywhere else on your roof. Now, this can be heavy. And you have to make sure with a white roof, um, not, with a, not so much with a white roof, I'm sorry, with a blue roof, uh, green roof, or brown roof, which we're going to get into later, you need to consult with a structural engineer, certified structural engineer, that can look at your roof and tell you whether it can take the load that you're going to be putting on it, whether it be just water from the rain, or whether it be soil and plants and water, or whatever it is that you're putting on the roof. You need to talk to a structural engineer. That's the first thing that you need to do when you seriously start thinking about putting any kind of um, heavy materials on top of the roof. So I cannot stress that enough. Structural engineer. Okay, I'm not a structural engineer. I wish I was. They make a lot of money. Um, so the New York City Department of Environmental Protection is really big on white roofs, and they have a couple of. Um, can we um, pass some of these back? This is awesome. Yeah, every single person showed up. This is a first. <laughs> <laughs> it's a backwards chair. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I know, right? You guys are um, reliable. Yeah. It's a new age for um, trade school. All right. So, thermal reflectance and thermal mass. We talked about these a little bit, but they're the specific um, ways that white, uh, blue roofs um, cool the roof. Um, thermal mass, because there's so much gravel that is used, and if you notice, the gravel is white, so it has that reflectance as well. Um, but it captures the heat, and it stores it, and releases it slowly. So generally, that's not like a great thing to happen, but it's better than just capturing it and releasing it to, to go through um, into the building itself. So it captures it on top of the roof, and it, it again stabilizes that spike that you generally see in the, in the early afternoon of heat. Um, and the thermal reflectance, I mean, most white uh, blue roofs are, they have certain standards. If you're doing a blue roof and you're applying for a building, co a, a building permit from the, from the Department of Buildings or DEC, they require that any ballasting, which is fancy word for gravel, and have um, a minimum reflectance of like 0.2 or 0.3, I can't remember, but it has to, it has to have some reflectance, it can't, just, it can't just be like black gravel, like lava rock or Mexican beach, beach stone. Um, so those are the two ways it work. And also, depending on the sun angle, water is highly reflective during the early morning and later afternoon. During the middle of the day when it's just shining right down, it's not really reflective, but when it glints off the water, I mean, it's, it can be 100% reflectance. So that's pretty awesome, but usually that's the, 
cooling morning and late afternoon sun, so it's not as effective. But it is a factor. So I want to talk about sanitary versus combined sewage systems. Does anybody in here know why that's important and why I would bring that up when we're talking about white roofs? Uh, I mean, green, blue roofs. <laughs> because blue roofs capture and store water on top of the roof. So New York City has a combined sewage system, which is this guy. And that means that all the water from a rain event whether it be snow melting or a storm or whatever it is, it combines with all the water from apartment buildings, industrial buildings, commercial buildings, whatever it is. And which is okay, you know, there's sewer treatment plants that take that water and they clean it. Um, a, a separated sewer, which is kind of like a very, it's not very new, but it, it's not typical in older cities like New York, Chicago, Boston, Philadelphia, um, San Francisco. Uh, there's a lot of cities that don't have separated sewers. And what a separated sewer is, it just takes the downspouts or the roof drains and it takes the stormwater drains and stuff from the streets and it puts it in one pipe and it just dumps it out into a river or stream or pond. And then it takes the municipal wastewater from buildings, uh, which is our sinks, our toilets, our washing machines. Uh, it takes it from industrial factories and stuff like that, whatever. They take all that water and they clean it in the wastewater management facility. Um, so it's, it's separated. Does anybody know why this would be a really big problem? Yes? Because when it rains a lot, the sewage and the storm water will eventually break that dam and go out into the creek untreated? Exactly. And that phenomenon is called a combined sewage overflow. Doesn't um, it happen every time it rains? <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah. Anytime we get 0.4 inches of rain somewhere in the city, not all of the combined sewage, there's different tiers. There's tier 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. 4 and 5 are just like kind of outliers. But we have a lot of tier two and three, and we have a few tier one combined sewage overflow outfalls in New York City. A lot of them happen to be on like Newtown Creek and the Gowanus, um, the Hudson River, and well, all of our rivers and streams. <coughs> that's where they are. And when it rains, even a little bit, you know, especially in watersheds where there's a large area of land that collects all the water in one sewer system. Um, called Tier 1, where more water enters this in, in, in 0.4 inches of rain is going to affect different watersheds differently. Watersheds are not the same in urban environments as they are in, in wildlife. Um, watersheds are typically like sewer sheds because it doesn't like all gather and go into the stream in the city. It all gathers and goes into the sewer in the city. So it's different here in, in urban environments. But this is the number one problem for urban for cities is combined sewage overflow, the number one ecological problem um, as defined by DEP, the Department of Energy, uh, Environmental Protection. So blue roofs help to reduce or mitigate this phenomenon by capturing water and storing it um, on top of the building before it goes into the sewer. Um, when you can reduce the amount of flow into the sewer during a, a peak storm event, even if they like lower that weir or, or that weir that's around the drain uh, somehow lets the water out a little bit later after everything is flooding the system, then it still helps as long as it's not at that peak uh, time. And it's the same thing if it's raining outside and you don't like combined sewage overflow, don't go take a shower. Don't go wash a load of clothes. Don't use water because that water is going to add to the combined sewage overflow. Another chair? Is there room for another chair? There's a chair in the front. Yeah. Can you guys just scoot back a little? I know. There's a chair in the It's okay. So, some benefits of blue roofs. They store um, water that could be used for irrigation or for cooling towers. 
Um, cooling towers are just the running of water over radiators that um, the ACs use to cool the air down and pump into the building. Um, they lower the roof maintenance cost, again, by reducing that spike in the early evening of temperature. Um, they extend the roof life um, by avoiding re-roofing costs and reducing solid waste. So because they extend the roof life, um, you're avoiding the re-roofing costs. But they, they, and again, because they extend that roof life, you're not having to take all that old roofing off every 25 years, and you can now do it every 50 years, reducing the amount of solid waste that you produce. And again, they comply with codes and green building programs. So some human benefits include recreational use and efficient use of space in dense urban environments. I didn't really put this in there, but there are some like crazy, you know, like splash pads on top of rooftops, um, creating pools with storm water, um, and just some interesting things that people are doing with, with blue roofs, but that's really on the fringe. It's not really happening everywhere. What I've described to you today is generally what a blue roof is understood to be. The other ones I would describe as like some sort of architectural art. <laughs> but they are interesting. Um, oops. Do you have a question? Yeah. So, yes. But, uh, what is happening to the water after you store it? How is it being finally released? Um, typically, it just when the sun comes back out, it evaporates. Because you're not storing a lot of water. You're you're usually only storing an inch to an inch and a half of water. But over you know a four thousand square foot roof, that adds up to a lot of water. And in general, you don't have storms that are. Um, you don't have really big storm events all the time, so not every storm event is going to drop more than an inch of water on the roof. So you're not really having that much water on the roof. It typically has time to evaporate between. Does it hold it for a while and then let it down after a couple days, too? It can, you can design the weirs, the drainage, in different ways. You can just design it to stop the water. Or you can design it to have small holes so that the water actually does kind of percolate through gradually over time. Very small holes. Um, so yeah, there's a different there's a couple different ways that you can create a blue roof and create that weir and the dam that holds the water back. Yes? I would imagine that the blue roof would become very heavy. Is yes, it does. So what kind of steps do you have to take for your own roof before creating a roof? Like I said, um, you need to consult with a structural engineer before you undertake any sort of putting things on top of your roof that are going to weigh anything. Um, on average, if, is it too heavy for most roofs? Um, Good structures. Yeah, I mean... Wooden structures, it's not a good idea. Most most buildings in the city have um, better rooftops than that. Um, buildings that were, in general, I'm speaking very loosely here, in general, buildings that were built before 1975 um, are a lot more robust than the buildings that were built after 1975. After that, um, they generally had better understanding of how to engineer rooftops to span larger surfaces and get very exact with their um, load-bearing capacities. Um, so the newer buildings have rooftops that are engineered to manage the live and dead loads that are existing on top of roofs. The mechanical stuff that's up there and the people that have to go maintain them um, the snow mass that accumulates, those are um, all calculated in. And generally, to save as much money, you, you build your building as, as lightly as possible. Um, nowadays, you know, people are thinking about this ahead of time, so they're actually building buildings that can accommodate blue roofs and green roofs and, and more weight on top of the roof. But if you have an older building, they weren't they were a little bit over-engineered just 
in case. Um, so generally, older buildings can hold a lot more weight on top of their roofs. But generally, older buildings are older too, so they have more deterioration, so there needs to be a more thorough inspection of whether that's true or not anymore. Because a lot of things can happen in that amount of time um, to the structural integrity of a building. So, um, ecological benefits of blue roofs include the reduction of uh, stormwater combined sewage overflow and um, the reduced water usage for irrigation and cooling towers. <coughs> Let's see. Okay. So, we're going to talk about green roof systems. Um, same kind of format. We're going to go a lot deeper into green roofs than we have on the other stuff because, well, frankly, I know a lot more about them. So, again, green roofs are not as new a technology as we like to think they are. Um, they were the standing roofing material in the Neolithic age in Northern Europe. And, I mean, all, most of the buildings were side and braced, side covered. Um, this is a lot different than what we, I know of as a green roof. You know, there's no drainage layer and root protection. You probably go into a structure like this and there's probably like roots hanging down from the ceiling, you know. So this is a lot different. But still, this just goes back to say that we're just, we're not reinventing things. We're just rediscovering our indigenous knowledge and we're trying to figure out how to do it again. And with all of our building codes, we're kind of shooting ourselves in the foot. So I did want to say that these are not green roofs. These are beautiful, and they do go some ways in capturing stormwater, increasing the aesthetics on top of a rooftop, increasing usable space in the city. Um, but these are planters and pots with plants in them. And that's not a green roof. It's a terrace garden, it's a rooftop garden, a roof deck garden, whatever you want to call it. It's not a green roof. Green roof is um, it's an engineered system that's comprised of several layers. And um, I have a few def couple definitions. Well, that's just one definition. But um, in general, you have your roof deck, you have your roofing membrane, which is typically your asphalt shingles or tar. Um, and then you start with the typical green roof construction, which is the roof barrier, which is just a thick piece of felt. We're, we're going to go into all these a little bit deeper, so I'm not going to go too deeply into them now. But there's an insulation layer sometimes. Some, a, a lot of people don't use, do the insulation because the green roof actually in, insulates by itself. Um, there's a drainage uh, or water mat that lets water drain. Um, and then there's a filter fabric, and then there's your growing medium, your soil, and your plants. So there's several layers to a green roof, and there's a couple different types of green roof. There's modular and there's monolithic. And with monolithic, you have um, extensive and intensive. And some people would say there's a gray area between those two. We'll talk about them all. So some key terms involved with green roofs are transpiration. Um, transpiration is the, the term used for uh, the way that plants put water back into the water cycle, drawing water up through the roots from the soil and releasing it through the stomata, uh, which is generally on the underside of their leaves. Um, a lot of things affect how transpiration works. When you have high winds, there's more water released. When you have high temperatures, there's more water released. Um, when you have, uh, there's, when there's more soil in the ground, there's more water released. So, and the inverse of all that, there's less water released. So, um, when you release water into the, into the air, you potentially reduce the temperature or the way that the, the, temp, the air temperature can feel sometimes. <laughs> Um, so, transpiration is a big thing for green roofs. Um, urban ecology. 
is another key term that I think Greeners kind of embody. Does anybody know what this is a picture of? Jamaica Bay. Jamaica Bay, that's right. Um, does anybody know why I would put Jamaica Bay as a picture describing urban ecology? Randy? No? Because it, it, yeah, they, they, it they is a wildlife re re refuge, it is a wetland, but it is completely man made. We destroyed Jamaica Bay. There was nothing left. And we came back in, and uh, the city decided it would be a good idea to reinvigorate the area with what, what should be there. I mean, it's obviously a place where nature needs to rejuvenate itself. So we replanted grasses, we put you know, quar logs everywhere and slowed down the water as it was flowing into the ocean. Um, we, and, and slowly invasive species started coming, which are the urban ecologies, um, pioneer species, and they made way, they loosened the soil, they detoxified the soils, they made way for other more native and indigenous species, and now it's a thriving wetland. So it's there, it's beautiful, it was there before, it was beautiful, but there was a time when it wasn't there. And now it can be said that it would not be there if it wasn't <coughs> for human interaction. It wouldn't have ever gone away if it wasn't for human action, but the fact is it's a completely human ecosystem, human created thing. You know, it, there's a lot of natural things going on that help it thrive now that we kind of like put something back there, but it's, it's an urban, it's a great example of an urban ecology. So, I'm not going to read the definition there, I think everybody understands what, what I'm talking about when I say urban ecology. Do and I've, like, back? There, they I mean, them back? Um, a lot of them have migrated back. Um, oh. There's actually, there was like a sighting of some dolphins in New York Harbor last year for the first time in like 40 years or something like that. So, I mean, they just, they come back, you know? It's just a matter of, the, of time. I feel like I missed a definition here. I know I had another, oh no, I guess that, that was it. All right, so green roof types. There's, like I said, there's modular, monolithic, and within monolithic there's intensive and extensive. So modular systems are pretty much just trays that you can fill up with soil and grow plants in, and you can move these trays to wherever you want to move them to. Um, they're great if you have a space that you're renting and you want to do a little green roof, but you don't want to like just invest all that money and leave it there. Uh, you want to take it with you. Um, or if you're, um, they're also a little, yes. So do these trays have all the layers in them? Not necessarily. Um, because they are in a tray, um, you have that root, root protection. Um, the water, they have little holes in the bottoms. I don't think you can see them there, but they have little holes in the sides where water can come out. And water naturally, when on top of a roof, as I said, it's pitched generally about 2% to a roof drain. So the water is going to go where it needs to go. Um, it doesn't need, need to have all the layers because it's not... Um, it's not something that's going to grow into the roof, and you're 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 putting it on top of the roof as a kind of a temporary thing. Mm -hmm. And there's the trays are usually metal; mm -hmm. they can't or plastic. Um, so I mean, they I guess plastic can deteriorate, roof can or metal can get rusty and get holes in the side. But in general, it, they don't have all those layers. No. There's not much difference than this in like a roof garden. Um, I mean, except that, like, the trees are shallow. Yes. Um, the difference is this would be kind of, like, all over the place. I kind of, um, if you have to plan on where you're going to walk because there's plants everywhere, that's generally a green roof. Um, that's kind of a really dumbed-down explanation or definition. But that's kind of the way I look at it. When you're, I mean... If you're putting these trays everywhere and you don't want to walk on them, you're going to have to put stepping stones kind of some places. 
And they make these trays the same size as a lot of stepping stones, so you can like intermingle stepping stones and trays and have like a walking path throughout, which is kind of nice too. So yes. Is this just sitting on a single membrane roof? What is the the light gray material? Yeah, that that's that's like the it's kind of like a white roof. It's a okay. very low grade. Not it's probably like a fifty or a point five on the reflectance. That's the gray. It's not really bright white. Um, but that's that's a white roof. And generally, you want to put something down below. You don't have to, but it's nice to protect your roof a little bit. Um, just in case the metal does start to rust and corrode, you don't want all that interaction with everything going on. So um, filter fabric, maybe even some EPDM, which we'll talk about in a little while, would be good to put underneath this stuff. So this roof is mainly for cooling, not for necessarily eating. From. No, not necessarily eating from. We'll talk about that in a little bit, a little bit too. Um, so an extensive green roof is, or rather a monolithic green roof, is one that uses all of the layers and the soil is all kind of together and the plants all kind of grow together as well. Um, extensive means that it's fairly shallow from three to four inches of, of soil. Um, intensive means that it's eight inches or more. There's this intermediate area that some people include and some people have no idea what anybody's talking about when you say there's something between ex extensive and intensive. But the fact is, <clears throat> if you just want grass, you have to put more than three or four inches. But you don't have to put enough soil to grow a tree. So there, there is that medium level of 6 to 12 inches. Grass does have a, a taller root profile in the soil. So, um, and coincidentally enough, that's enough soil to grow fruit producing crops or, or leafy greens or even root vegetables. So that's where you want to grow like your, your produce in that kind of 6 to 12 inch area. So I'm going to talk about the specific components of a green roof system, which includes the waterproofing root barrier, the drainage board, filter fabric, the lightweight growing medium, <coughs> and plants. So waterproofing, when you are up on a finished roof, as I said earlier, it's important to choose a roof that is fairly new, that has um, a long warrantied life in front of it. You don't want to go up on top of a roof that's already been there for 20 years, it's about falling apart, and then say, oh, let's put a green roof on this. You, you want to start fresh. So when you do start fresh, you want to go ahead and take the extra effort of waterproofing it again. The roof should be watertight. The roofer, whoever did, did the construction of that roof, should have made sure there's no water getting through that thing. You, as a green roof installer, want to go back and say, I don't trust this, these people, I'm going to do it myself. And you want to pay close attention to the penetrations, and um, you want to really waterproof around those, and, you want, and the typical material that you use is EPDM. It's a thick rubber. Um, it comes in a couple of, well, it comes in a lot of different th thicknesses, um, generally uh, 0.5 mils. Um, uh, is this kind of a standard and there's 0.7 as well. Uh, so they come in huge rolls like um, 5 feet long and you can get them in 50 feet long or 100 feet long. Um, they can get really heavy. They're hard to get on top of roofs especially when you only have um, an elevator that goes to maybe the top floor uh, because the elevator machinery is on the roof. So you have to take everything up that one last flight of steps. In general, you bring the soil up with a crane, um, but you have to get a lot of things onto the roof before you start putting soil up there. So this is this is one of the, all these the first three components, or the first four components. You have to get up there before you get soil, so you can just start spreading that soil around because you can't just 
unless you have a super strong roof, you can't just stockpile a bunch of soil wherever the crane can reach. You have to put a big bag of soil down, spread it out, put another big bag, spread it out, um, so that you're not super loading that one spot on the roof. So that's the waterproofing. So, so are you saying that you do that after the roofers are done? Yes. So and but they put a waterproof barrier down already, right? So yes. you have to make sure yours is really good or else you'll get water in between the two barriers. Yes. So how do you know that you totally sealed it perfectly? Like is there any kinds of tests or Oh well, yeah, you can flood your roof. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> I highly suggest that you flood your roof before and after your waterproofing. You want to do it before to make sure that they've done a good job and that there's no ponding. If there's ponding, then somebody didn't pitch the roof correctly, and I've seen it before, and it's not a good scenario. Um, so you, you definitely want to flood your roof, and that's a, a flood test is something that building inspectors do all the time. I mean, when a building is built, it gets a flood test. And you want to do a flood test yourself, <coughs> the building inspector is going to come and do it later. So you better make sure that it's good because it's going to get tested whether you do it or not. And how do you do a flood test? You put it, you stop the drain and turn on the water. That's pretty much it. <laughs> um, so, I'm going to talk about the root barrier. It's pretty much a thick piece of fabric, felt, um, and it's impregnated with copper um, compounds. And what that does is it, it hinders the root growth. Roots don't like growing in copper. So, um, it's got a copper lining, essentially. Um, some of them don't. Some of them are just really thick pieces of felt. I don't see the point, um, but it's some of them are out there without the copper in them. I would suggest that you, if you're doing this, you find the, a root protection barrier, not just like a protection fabric, because any landscape fabric isn't going to have the copper compounds. You need to look for that. It's again with the ASTM standard that will tell you what's in there. You need to check out what you're buying. So the drainage board or the drainage mat, um, these are drainage boards. They're, you know, four by six mm -hmm. boards, um, and they're this kind of a waffle wafer um, thing. They have holes up here on the top, and they hold water um, in their cups. Um, generally, the plant roots can't get to this water, but it's nice to have that water held up on the roof for the same reason um, that you're holding water for the blue roofs. Um, and although it doesn't generally get too hot, the water can evaporate into the soil above, so the roots can get to that water through when it gets hot enough to evaporate, which is when the roots need it the most, actually. So that's the drain board. There's also a drainage mat which is, it comes in a roll, and it's, um, it looks like super industrial size, like packing bubble wrap, but you can't pop these bubbles. They're, they're really hard plastic. Um, some of it comes with a, a, fil a felt backing, and you can also get it with a felt on both sides. Um, generally, the felt on the bottom is not root protection and impregnated with copper, uh, compounds. It's just another piece of felt. So when the company I work for buys this, there's usually a felt on top, which acts really nice because the next layer of this system is a filter fabric because you don't want your soil going directly into your water drainage medium or else it's not going to drain the water as effectively. It's going to be all silted up with soil. So you just lay this out on top of your drainage mat or drainage board, and um, I like to overlap it and tuck in the sides so that the soil doesn't go in to the sides. Um, really simple, filter fabric. And then you have your lightweight engineered growing medium, which I have. This isn't necessarily 
what it is, but this is um, this is ex expanded shale slate or clay, which is um, they're basic, you know, earth materials. And what they do is they um, break them off in little pieces, and they heat them up in a tumbler, and they expand. I guess kind of like popcorn. Um, and it's really lightweight. Of course, it has some organic material. It is organic material, but it doesn't have like readily available organic material for roots to take and grow with. Um, it doesn't ex absorb a whole lot of water. And again, it's really lightweight. So it's an ideal um, kind of additive uh, for a roofing um, medium. Notice I did not say soil or dirt. Because it's really not. I mean, this stuff is this kind of this has like a high embodied energy, right? Does everybody know what embodied energy is? No. It's where you, um, in order to produce something, you have to put a lot of energy into it. Take photovoltaic cells. Just last year, they got to a point where they had less embodied energy than they could produce over the life of the photovoltaic cell. So, as you're creating the photovoltaic cell, you have to use petroleum. You have to extrude it through high heat, pressure, and mechanical processes to create this solar panel. And before early last year, all the energy that it took to make that solar cell was not regained throughout the life of collecting <coughs> energy from the sun. So it was really a net loss in energy. That's embodied energy. So this stuff has kind of a high embodied energy. It's an engineered system. Um, this company right here, Rooflight, is kind of the leader in um, engineered growing mediums for green roofs. Um, there's also, also a company in the Bronx. I wish I wrote it down on here, but it's, um, it's Gaia, uh, Gaia Soil. Um, a guy named Paul Mankiewicz has created Gaia Soil. He uses, uh, he reuses polystyrene as his lightweight medium. So he's taking materials out of the waste stream instead of using highly engineered, high embodied materials as the lightweight medium. Which is interesting, but it ends up being a little bit too weight, lightweight and it flies away. <laughs> so um, it's not used as much as it, it should be, I think. Um, the other lightweight growing thing is Metro Mix. We typically mix in uh, Metro Mix Metromix is a, is a brand name. Um, all it is is it's um, other lightweight materials like um, dolomite and uh, just different powders and stuff that are mixed into soils um, to, to make a lightweight topsoil or a lightweight. Uh, it's kind of like um, miracle Grow. It's a proprietary mix of different minerals. miracle Grow puts fertilizer in it. There's no fertilizer in that, but it's just a mix of, of soil that happens to be lightweight. And it's used a lot in uh, planter pits, um, or pots that are up on terraces. And we typically amend our roof light with Metro Mix. Um, so that's another consideration. You want to get lightweight soils. The more organic um, a soil is, uh, the more um, compost or humus it has in it, the more it weighs more. Um, it's it's richer for plants, so it, it can produce a, a healthier uh, plant, but it also absorbs more water. So it weighs more, and then when it rains, it weighs even that much more. Um, so it's you, you have to be careful with what you use on top of your rooftop, especially if your civil engineer tells you, oh, you can put a green roof here, but you need to be careful about exactly how, you know, if you're really kind of like trying to stay under a certain level of weight, you really need to mind these little details. So your typical green roof plants, um, these are called sedum. Um, these are grown on extensive green roofs which is the um, three to four inches. Sedum are a succulent type of plant, meaning that they store water within their, root, uh, within their leaf structure. And they're, uh, most of them are alpine uh, species, which means that they grow in um, ecological situations where it's very rocky or craggy surfaces of a, of a mountain face even, 
where they don't have a big root system. Um, so they're ideal to grow in this sort of soil. Um, if you put them in rich soil that has a lot of water all the time, they're going to absorb too much water and they're going to suffer. Um, they actually are quite beautiful. There are some native species. Typically, native species are not really used that much. Um, there are lots of different sedum out there. Um, I focus on these because this is, this is the typical green roof plant. If you have an intensive green roof, which is a higher soil profile, you can grow, I'm not going to say anything up there because there are special conditions, including extreme heat, lots of wind, um, but you, you have a much broader palette and there's really no typical um, plants for that situation. Um, so the last thing that you listed was the lightweight engineered growing medium. Yes. Then you don't put soil on top? That's the soil. That is the soil. That is the soil. Mm -hmm. You don't actually use soil or topsoil because topsoil is much too heavy. Okay. And you would probably exceed the weight capacity of your roof if you used even three to four inches of topsoil across an entire roof um, is, is quite heavy once you want, okay, so a lightweight growing medium after it rains can weigh um, around 12 to 16 pounds per square foot, whereas topsoil after a good drenching will, re will re weigh closer to 25 to 30 pounds per square foot. So you're talking about doubling the weight, essentially, of your soil. Now it's good to amend your lightweight growing medium with compost, um, topsoil, other lightweight growing mediums, but you don't want to put straight topsoil or soil on top of your roof. What happens if you want to grow food? You have to amend it with compost regularly, just like you would a regular agricultural planting bed. So you put that and then the compost on top and yes. then you can plant. Yes. Yes. Has anyone heard of the Brooklyn Grange? Yeah. We're going to talk about it a little bit later. Um, they use roof light on their soil. That was their main. Um, that's their main growing medium, and they also compost up there. Um, I'm sure there's other people that help them, but the Western Queen Compost Initiative is a big player for them. They do a lot of composting on top of their roof, and that compost is used to amend their roof light. Yes. So uh, eventually compost has to be, so, I mean, compost will create weight after a while, right? If you just keep on adding compost, it's, it's soil that will absorb water. Yes. The thing with compost is you, use it, you add compost to your soil to amend it so that your vegetables can grow healthy. And you pull your vegetables out of the ground and eat them. So you're taking that away. A grain, a lot of that is photosynthesis. That's just straight sunlight that's turned into... Um, wonderful stuff for us to enjoy, but a lot of it does come from the soil as well. So, yes, you have to keep on amending it, but it's not like every time you amend it, you're adding that much more. You're actually taking, every time you harvest, you're taking it out too. So the idea is that you're harvesting. With these plants, you're not harvesting. You're going to leave them there, and the interesting thing about succulents is when a leaf breaks off or something, as soon as, when it touches the soil or the, the growing medium, it starts to root again. So it's every, every leaflet is basically like a, a seed or a seedling. Um, of course, it does have seeds, and you can start them from seed. But the wonderful thing is you can just go out to something like this and like grab a handful and just like throw it somewhere else, and it does good. But like I said, if you give it really rich soil, it's not going to do so good. It needs really bad, terrible soil that loses water really quickly and is really rocky. This is not rocky, by the way, but it's typically understood to be rocky. Um, so those are the components of the green roof. Um, how am I doing on time? <laughs> oh, I'm way over on time. Um, should I just plow forward? Does yes. anybody have to go? Do we have to shut down? No. Alright, well, I'll, I'll try to speed it up a little bit. Um, so green roof considerations. There's a lot of things. I actually teach a very long 24-hour course at CUNY, City Tech, 
which we go much more in depth about. I'm really bossing over all this information right now. But just to give you an idea, ballasts and penetrations along the edge. You need you need to you can't you have you can't have vegetation up to the edge of a roof. You have to have a fire stop so that there's no fire jumps. It's part of the the NYC building code. So you have to have uh, gravel uh, 18 inches along your the sides of your roof, the bulkhead wall, and you need to again mind your penetrations. Is that a law, Jim? That's a law. Yeah, it's hmm. building code. Which we is, don't do it. We don't do it. Which is In in the front and mm -hmm. back, you have to have even more, right? And for for a house, for the fire department, I think wants six feet in the front or something just to move around. That's from the ingress and egress. Right. Where the where the stairway comes up, you have to have room for people to come out. Okay. There's a lot of stuff involved that we that I'll go deeper into when I have more time. Um, so rooftop farming, by, I'm going to talk about a few things, I'm going to run through it because again we're like past our time here. But um, River Park Farm, it's a modular system, um, uh, it's located uh, like around here, around the corner actually, um, oh wait not around the corner, but um, on the East River, and um, there's like 7,400 milk crates that they have just put landscape fabric in, and filled with soil, real soil, not like lightweight grown medium because they have really structurally sound area. But it's a temporary thing. Um, this is a stalled construction site. I, I think that's interesting. Uh, it's a for-profit thing. They supply food directly to one particular restaurant, River Park, which is Tom Colicchio restaurant. Um, pretty awesome. Uh, the Brooklyn Grange, uh, it's a one acre, it's a for-profit rooftop farm. It's in Long Island City, Queens. There's going to be a second one. They won a uh, DEP grant last year for $592,000 um, to, to do a second one at the uh, Brooklyn Navy Yard. They're doing pretty cool things. They've got a Kickstarter campaign right now for uh, 25 Hive Apiary, which will be the largest honey producing apiary in New York City. Um, they have a market in their lobby in Long Island City. Um, on Wednesdays from May, 20, May 16th to October 14th. Um, Bright Farms. So I have a lot of information about a new Bright Farm that's going to, that just, they just announced this in a press release like last week. This is um, one that they did in conjunction with Sunworks, which is an, it's an educational component of it. But Bright Farms builds greenhouses on top of rooftops. They do hydroponic, uh, aquaponic, and um, systems. And this one is a classroom on top of PS333 on uh, West 93rd Street. Um, so the one that they're building is going to be the largest uh, rooftop farm in America. It's multiple acres. Um, and it has a lot of stuff that's going to be going on with it. It's going to create 25 jobs. It's going to prevent as much as 1.8 million gallons of stormwater from going into local waterways. I couldn't figure out if that was like per year or what. I'm imagining that's per year, but I, I don't know. Um, maybe it's over the life of the thing. It didn't really say on the website. But um, that was such a great stat. I listed it twice. Um, <laughs> it's all greenhouses. Everything they're doing is greenhouses. Yeah, for the most part. I, that's what I get from To make the it site. the largest, whatever you call it, the largest rooftop farm. It's a greenhouse farm. It, it's a, yeah, it's a greenhouse farm, which is interesting because you can have 365-day production from a greenhouse. Um, their model is to put greenhouses on top of grocery stores, so it's direct, direct produce sales through the grocery store. Um, this one in particular is on top of a large industrial complex in Sunset Park, or it will be. Um, so costs, government incentives, tax abatement. Um, I don't have a slide here about cost, but it costs generally whatever it costs to, to put a roof on top of a building, double it. Um, and that's for a really basic, extensive green roof. If you want a walkway with a pergola and like just all these nice features, you're talking about serious landscape architecture and design and construction. Um, if you just want the whole thing to be green roof engineered system, three to four inches of soil and seed them, um, about $25, $35 per square foot. What about irrigation? 
You don't need irrigation for an extensive green roof that has sedum. You do need to water it, uh, get, some, get some water up there for the first month or two, just to establish everything. But after that, it'll pretty much take care of itself. If you have an intensive roof, it's just like, um, actually it's more, it's more maintenance is required for an intensive roof than it would be if you had just a garden down, downstairs. Like I was saying earlier with transpiration, when there's a lot of wind, the plants transpire more. They release more water into the atmosphere, which sucks up the water from the soil, which there's a limited amount of, and it doesn't have reserves of soil to pull capillary action from the, the soil below, pull that water up. So it needs more water. Um, it's going to get more sun. It's generally hotter. Um, but you, it does require a lot of maintenance if you have an intensive rooftop. There's a reason it's called intensive. What about uh, the modular uh, system? The um, modular system is generally the sh shallower um, right. ones. So Unless you're talking about the one that they have at River Camp where they use the milk crates. That, I mean, that's agricultural purposes, highly maintenance. You know, they go out there every day and harvest and weed and, and take care of their stuff. Well, I actually, um, I actually met, uh, I didn't actually say the question, but um, how much would, because that's not really the same, it's not like you're really installing a roof. Oh, the costs. Plant, right? Yeah. Um, they're a little bit lower, actually. Um, you can generally do that for around $20, give or take five like 15 to 25 dollars um, per square foot um, but yeah uh, it's, it's a good question thank you so there is a um, there is a, a property tax abatement um, in effect right now which offers property owners four point five well four and a half dollars per square foot of green roof up to a max of a hundred thousand um, dollars to install a new green roof on their building uh, typically, unless you're doing something that exceeds the max, um, and you've already got, you've already budgeted for paying a civil engineer, a designer, a contractor, all the people, and you've got a big roof, this doesn't come into play. This is for big real estate power players. It's not for people that want to put a green roof on their brownstone. It, it, it's a nice gesture for those people. They'll get some money back, but you're not going to install, you're not going to, this isn't going to help you like pinch pennies on installing a green roof because when you do this, you have to get your, you know, all your papers in order, all your ducks in a row. You have mm -hmm. to submit paperwork to the city. It, it's the whole shebang and that costs more than doing it just kind of like DIY style. So you're not going to get a rebate for DIY stuff, but it is there for p big players that do want to, you know, green their buildings. How big is big? Um, <clears throat> square foot. I think it works out to like two thousand <coughs> five hundred square feet. Is like the max that you could get rebated. Which, I mean, really, <clears throat> well, I don't know. It's not that big, but it's definitely bigger than a brownstone roof. You know, that's a commercial property. Mm -hmm. you know. Alright, so um, like I said, the BEP is giving out grants. Um, the Brooklyn Grange won one last year. Uh, I think they had like 15 people that won grants. They gave out uh, $3.8 million in total. They've got, oh wait, yeah, they gave out $3.8 million last year. They've got $1.5 billion to give out over the next 20 years for what they're calling green infrastructure, mm -hmm. but it's green infrastructure that focus on water mitigation. They're trying to reduce combined sewage overflow. That is the specific purpose of their green infrastructure grant program. So um, this includes green roofs, blue roofs, porous concrete, and bioswales, um, among other you know, inventive things that landscape architects and civil engineers can come up with. Uh, so there's a link. You can find out all the people that won. Uh, it's an interesting little exercise. There's more links that's not really going to help you right now. Um, <coughs> green roof technical benefits. Uh, the EPA sewer connection is like a pilot program, program right now where they're seeing if they're going to impose a tax on like people that build parking lots that discharge a lot of rain or people that have large roofs that discharge a lot of rain during rain events. So that's probably coming down the pipeline where people are going to have higher taxes because of those things. 
Whereas if you can mitigate those, then you can reduce your taxes. Um, thermal resistance during the summertime, thermal insulation during the wintertime, not only um, does it do what white roofs um, do and blue roofs, which is reduce the amount of heat coming into a building, but in the wintertime it reduces the amount of heat leaving the building. So that's the thermal insulation. Um, it extends the life of the roof. So, so that's even for um, deciduous, like if it's an intensive, let's say, vegetable garden, you don't have anything growing in the winter. You still that's a good question. It's, it's, it is, but it isn't, because you still have the three inches, or actually probably six to eight inches of soil for your vegetable production. It is actually acting as an insulate insulator, but because the vegetation is not there, then not so much. But I mean, the vegetation itself acts better as a as blocking the sun, not so much keeping heat from escaping. So that's um, it's a good question, though, and that's that's one reason that um, that this last slide that I showed you here. They, when they first rolled this out, they did not count um, vegetated roofs that were used to grow um, produce, because there was these brown this brown space between mm -hmm. your rows that wasn't, you know, they didn't they were saying that it wasn't as good, but they've gone back retro retroactively and they've changed their stance on that because they got a bunch of blowback from people like me. Mm -hmm. um, so it extends the life of your basically everything that ever that all the other stuff does, green roofs do. Um, I wanted to point this out in particular. Your air conditioners located on top of your rooftops, they intake air and they cool 